So, welcome to this lecture of uh, environmental geomechanics and here I am going to talk about uh, cracking characteristics of soils and geomaterials. Very important subject and uh, frankly speaking I learned this subject from two events which happened in my life. One is I was contacted by the BCCI for creating fast and sporting pitches in the country. Before that I had not considered cracking characteristics much in my research career. And number two, most of the time in Mood Indigo, the annual festival of students which is organized by them at IIT Bombay, one potter used to come. And then I always used to ask him a question that uh, how come it so happens that whatever pottery you make, it never cracks. Because there are many instances in our practice of geotechnical engineering where we come across soils which have cracked. Particularly starting from let us say shrinkage limit determination, where the more emphasis is that dry the soils in such a manner that they do not crack. That means, you are still ensuring saturation is 1, you are not allowing air to enter into the pores. That means, it has to be very, very slow heating. So, these are the two questions, two instances sorry, not questions, uh, which motivated me to take up research in the cracking characteristics of soils and then I was quite uh, happy and lucky to work on these topics with uh, some of my PhD scholars like uh, Professor Uday Kala who is in IIT Mandi, then uh, Dr. Pratyusha who is at uh, NIT Hyderabad, not Hyderabad, NIT Andhra Pradesh and uh, one of my MTech students Sudarshan who did uh, most of the work and he is now in Dar Consultant. The, our consultancy. These are the people through whom I learned this subject uh, cracking characteristics of soils, which I am going to discuss over here. Why only fine grain? Because we know that only fine grain soils will crack, particularly during desiccation or due to heating or due to moisture migration. Coarse grain materials will not crack. Crack development, what is the conceptual model? Tensile strength of geomaterials. I think uh, you must have realized that this is the property or the characteristics of geomaterials which normally we do not employ much in our subject. But subsequently, if you initiate your research in the field of fine grained soils and why do they crack because of desiccation, you will realize that cracking of these fine grained soils is a function of their tensile strength. To complete the sentence, desiccation induced cracking of soils is a function of their tensile strength. Now, desiccation is a phenomena which is environmental activity, it will depend upon environmental parameters, temperature, humidity, speed of the wind, solar cycle, all right precipitation, so on. So, take a soil sample and just leave it in the ambient conditions and let it dry. What happens? There are two, two possibilities, either it will crack, it will not crack. Most of the fine grain materials will crack because of the presence of minerals which are active minerals. Fine. So, how to detect whether the soils have cracked or not and how to quantify this whole thing? See, you must be realizing a simple issue. We might speak something, but then the question is as a researcher, as a technologist, as an engineer, somebody is going to ask me a question, how will you quantify this? So, so far whatever I have said is descriptive, qualitative. So, from qualitative, how will you quantify things? That means, if I take a soil mass, 
if I leave it in the environment, environmental conditions can be quantified. It cracks, okay. The question is why it cracks, how much it cracks, what is the implication of the cracking? Because the moment cracks are formed, we are inducing dual porosity in the soil mass or the geomaterials. So, quantification becomes very important. That means the cracks have to be linked with the induced dual porosity in the porous media. So, you will realize that most of the research which is being carried out right now, in those cases we consider cracking characteristics and induced dual porosity. For that quantification is a must and to quantify we require images as the sample dries, as the event occurs, as the process happens. So, that means you keep on observing over the entire drying process and then try to create an image to show how cracks are propagating in the porous media. This was successfully done by my students whom I named. This is where the philosophy comes from thin film to thick films. It was a sheer chance, matter of chance that I was visiting a, a factory where the potato chips were being made and they wanted some idea on how to optimize the dimensions of these potato chips. You must have observed when potato chips are transported from one place to another place, they normally do not crumble. Why? Number two, if they crumble, what is their fate? Nobody will buy, buy it. So, from there, this idea came to my mind that usually we talk about thick samples. I use the term thick films. Your UDS samples are thick, triaxial samples are thick, odometer samples are also quite thick. The direct shear specimens are also very thick. And most of the time what we have done is we have tried to learn or determine their properties. But suppose if I keep on thinning down these specimens and if I come to the granular state of the material and if I can create a very thin film of the minerals, how the similarity between the potato chips, potato wafers and the thin films of the soils or the geomaterials can be you know understood or can be uh, simulated. So, this was the genesis of the philosophy of thin film to thick film. The reverse process is you start from very thin film, keep on adding more and more material to this and then this becomes a thick film. So, this is where thin film to thick film transformation took place uh, in terms of cracking characteristics of geomaterials. And of course, uh, this also leads to a very interesting topic uh, on which unfortunately we could not work much, but concrete technologists are doing good work, self healing and self sealing minerals. That means, if cracking occurs, how to stop them number one, minerals which are present in the uh, remediation technique or remediation solutions should be intelligent enough to realize that they are getting exposed to the atmosphere and they should seal the crack. So, if you can create these type of minerals, that will be a very good uh, contribution to the subject. So, let us start with the cracking characteristics of fine grained soils. So, fine grained soils such as clays, expensive soils, active clay minerals are prone to cracking, development of shrinkage cracks due to loss of moisture, drying, this is what is desiccation process. Uh, it might occur in earthen dams, landfill, liners, covers, embankments, earth slopes, cricket pitches, tennis court, everywhere, wherever you are using the soils and the minerals. Understanding of cracking is necessary for assessing the safety of structures built on or with the soil mass because of the change in porosity and permeability and the migration of different types of mass flux. The cracked soil mass would exhibit extremely high hydraulic conductivity, gas permittivity and reduced strength and hence soil may not be useful for containment facilities. 
particularly those who are working in the field of uh, landfills, design of uh, landfill covers, basal liners, uh, they also require this information tracking characteristics. And this is linked with the tensile strength of soils. This is how typically the cracking characteristics occur. This is one of uh, my consulting projects where because of the overnight rains flooding took place and because of this flooding the type of soil which was used was a active material, its soil and the entire facility which was about to be located on this failed. And when the postmortem analysis was done for the sake of insurance, then we realized that the type of material which was used for backfilling was not the right one. So, everything is you know quite interlinked in the profession. So, look at these cracks which develop, sometimes these type of cracks also, also develop on the uh, pitches which are liked by spinners. So, there was a time when India was quite famous for the spinner. So, we still we have very good spinners. These cracks might propagate quite deep inside uh, also and then uh, loss of strength occurs um, and uh, ingress of moisture, water also takes place. The conceptual model is uh, due to drying, the tensile stresses will build up. Now, what happens is you have studied this uh, capillary theory. That means, the soil mass can be assumed to be combination of capillaries and these capillaries are nothing but the pores. So, when the drying occurs, what happens? The surface tension tries to hold the moisture adhered to the soil particles, but now there is a loss of moisture. So, what is going to happen? The surface tension is going to build up much more beyond the tensile strength of the soil mass. And because of that, the tensile stresses develop because of the surface tension and this results into primary cracks, secondary cracks and tertiary cracks and then ultimately the entire system yields. So, what is the mechanism of mobilization of the tensile strength? Soil is normally a three phase system, <coughs> soil water air interaction. We have dry soils where we have apparent cohesion, partially saturated soils, where we have surface tension playing a very important role and then we have fully saturated soils, where surface tension does not come into the picture. Now, tensile strength will play a vital role in cracking of the soils as, as I just discussed. So, particularly the soils which will swell and shrink much more will show more tensile strength. So, this also gives us an indication that tensile strength is a function of total suction of the soil and that is one of the methods for finding it out. Now, our philosophy was on which most of my students worked that uh, tensile strength sigma t is a function of moisture content, unit weight of the soil, type of soil, you know it is uh, clay content, clay content in the form of percentage. Soil type will take of take care of the mineralogy. This is the clay fraction, physical depending upon the less than 2 micron, cation exchange capacity, plasticity index, specific surface area and the suction of the soil on which we have worked. So, whenever the tensile strength has, is talked about, this is always related to the sensitivity of the soil and sensitivity I am sure you must have studied is the shear strength of the soil in undisturbed and remolded forms. So, you must have noticed when you bring the soil which are active and when you remold them, just because of the transfer of heat from your palm or the fingertips, the evaporation might occur and the soils might crack or if you leave them exposed to the atmosphere for some time, they may crack. These are also supposed to be the sensitive soils. So far, we have just talked about the sensitivity in terms of remolded strength, undisturbed strength. So, here actually we talk about type of loading which is being exposed onto the soil mass. So, most of the time we talk about compressive and shearing 
and we do not consider the tensile strength or the tensile loading which is also very critical. Why? Because when we stretch the soil mass, what happens is its surface area gets uh, stretched or basically surface area becomes much more higher. Now, how will you study this or how will you understand this simple phenomena? To understand this simple phenomena, we can consider the particulate system for of the soil or a granular material under tensile loading. So, once you are stretching it, now what is happening? All these grains are contributing in terms of their surface. So, once we are stretching this in a tension mode, exposition of greater surface area of grains will occur and hence it will show more environmental activity and reactivity. On the contrary, when you are compressing it, what is happening? When you are compressing this whole mass, these grains come together and they camouflage each other on the surface. So, because of this camouflaging, what will happen? The total surface area of the grains is not getting exposed to the environment. This also is the genesis of a philosophy that if you want to characterize particularly active minerals in the soil, compressive strength cannot be a good indicator and what we should be doing? Then we should be utilizing tensile strength. Why? Because we are exposing each grain, you know, and we are allowing it to interact with the environment much more as compared to its compressive state. This philosophy has been used by people to characterize the soils which are active. And from this point onwards, the tensile strength comes in picture. Now, the question is, how will you obtain the tensile strength? Because this is not taught much, I am sure, is it not? We normally talk about the tensile strength of the rocks or the rock mass, but normally we do not talk about the tensile strength of the soil. So, this is one stage ahead of the conventional geotechnical engineering which people are taught. One of the best ways to characterize the swelling type of soils would be their tensile phenomena or tensile strength. How will you obtain it? Big question. There are direct measurements in the laboratory or in situ and there are some measurements which are based on image analysis indirect. Both have their limitations and pros and cons in fact. Okay. So, accurate and direct measurement of crack patterns and geometry area of each segment. When I say segment, you must have realized that when the soils crack, they create segments. Look at this. These are the segments. Each sector is a segment. This is one of the segments. Length of the crack, how they are interconnected, whether they are primary cracks, secondary cracks, tertiary cracks, what is the inclination, what is the length, how they are interconnected, what is the area of the segment which is encapsulated between the cracks. These are the parameters which become very important for finding out the tensile strength. So, linking of all these parameters is a big challenge with physico chemical mineralogical properties and particularly its unsaturated state. Now, what will happen if you do this type of testing uh, soil properties under environmental conditions, under loading conditions and keeping in view different sample sizes can be estimated. So, the best and simple method is you do triaxial testing, all right. But unfortunately, triaxial testing on swelling type of soils is again a very big challenge. Hope you realize this. So, from here, if I do triaxial testing, what I will be getting? I will be getting compression test results and if I draw a more Coulomb envelope, this axis is sigma axis and this is shear strength axis. So, wherever this 
Mohr Coulomb envelope intersects the sigma axis. This is what is going to be the tensile strength. Easy to obtain. Got it? The intercept of the Mohr Coulomb envelope on the x axis or the normal stress axis will give you sigma t value. We have ignored this concept in most of our geotechnical engineering testing. And what do we do? We modify the Mohr Coulomb envelope starting from 0, 0 by giving it a non-linear nature. Why? Because we are ignoring sigma t, which is not the right thing. So, what we did is we took different types of soils, we tested them under triaxial condition, we obtained their sigma t value. This work was done by my student uh, Mr. Ramana and Ramana is now heading I think Jacobs, it is a consulting group and uh, he is the guy who did most of the work on development of empirical relationships for obtaining the tensile strength. Then we came out with different types of equations where you will realize a liquid limit, velocity index, cation exchange capacity, percentage, clay fraction, suction, activity of the soil has been used. So, if you read the papers which have been written by Hanuman Prao and Ramana, uh, you will realize that there are several limitations which we have highlighted of the relationships which were proposed by the researchers. And then we have also mentioned that rather than going into all these details, it will be very easy and useful if you can link tensile strength with suction itself. So, here you will find some of the theories which have been given by earlier researchers where tensile strength has been linked with the suction. In other efforts, tensile strength has been linked with cation exchange capacity also. So, these are different different philosophies. Uh, you should read the paper by Anuman Rao and Ramana. So, we wanted to improvise upon this by using lesser parameters. So, we came out with the generalized relationships like this that tensile strength is a function of percentage clay fraction, cation exchange capacity and suction. So, my philosophy was here was that this is the physical phenomena, this is the chemical phenomena and this is a mineralogical phenomena. One thing you must have realized in this course is everywhere we talk about physical, chemical, mineralogical changes. If you go back to my first, second, third discussions which I had, I have introduced this concept of physical, chemical, mineralogical changes which occur in the system because of thermal, mechanical, chemical, electrical, magnetic, biological, radiation effects. So, this we must be realizing, this is a pure philosophy. But then later on we realize that cation exchange capacity and suction are related to each other because suction is also sort of a parameter which is represented by the physics and the chemistry of the material. You remember suction has two components if you ignore the bio suction and the cryo suction. We have metric suction and osmotic suction. So, metric suction is because of the percentage of the clay fractions and the chemistry, the, the, the uh, you know uh, chemisuction comes because of the cation exchange capacity okay, of the pore fluid. So, we got rid of the suction and then we realized that this will take care of the physico chemical phenomena. And then we proved our hypothesis, all this is published work, so you can please go through it. What I am trying to highlight here is that uh, there is enough scope to create new science, new ideas in this subject. These are just some glimpse of what people did you know in the past. It does not deter you from not doing something better than this. So, this you can assume as a baseline research work. Now, many times if you do image analysis, this is uh, done by Professor Uday Kala uh, at Mandi. We did very systematic analysis starting from at t equal to 0, how the cracks develops and migrates 
over a period of time, all right. So, uh, we did some crack pattern analysis, uh, where what I am trying to show you here is that this is the initial sample and then how it cracks over a period of time and how this crack migration occurs in the, in the sample or the specimen. These are different images at different times. And then we wanted to see the crack propagation, crack migration It is a very big subject for some of you who might like to pursue your career. Every industry, particularly manufacturing, requires experts in the field of, you know, material testing, crack identification, material anomaly and so on. So, cracking of a system is a sort of an anomaly. A good example is aircraft industry, after number of flights they want to estimate how much damage has occurred to the body of the aircraft, they cannot take risk because there are a lot of shearing effects, there are a lot of external forces which are acting on the wings and the body of the aircraft. So, they want to do these studies, I mean this just to give you an idea about it is not only the geotechnical engineering making pitches and turfs, you know where the applications would be. So, this is the real life situation which we wanted to simulate in the laboratory. So, the one of the ways is take a sample patch and then digitize it, okay. After digitizing it, we wanted to understand the micro features of the crack. You can realize this is up to 200 micrometer scale we wanted to see what is the crack width, how crack opens up and where it equilibrates after what time. So, basically what we realized is that the crack width is a function of maximum possible, it is nothing but the normalized value Cw upon Cw max is a function of the volumetric moisture content and volumetric moisture content at saturation. So, if I compare these two moistures because at saturation moisture is changing over a period of time to give rise to theta value. So, truly speaking normalized Cw is a function of normalized volumetric moisture content. I hope you can realize sometime back I was discussing about this fact that gravimetric moisture content is not a very good tool to deal with the micro mechanics that occur in soils and geomaterials, where you have to go for volumetric moisture content, because that controls the process and the mechanism at the micro level, this is a good example. A will be depending upon different types of soils and the ambient conditions in which the process is occurring. What does this indicate? It indicates that these type of studies should be done for different type of soils, different types of mineralogies exposed to different environmental conditions to come out with the models and then you can characterize them better. So far what we have done is we have said these are active passive soils, but we have not quantified them, you know. So, the model which we are discussing would be a very big boon in quantifying how active a soil is, how passive a soil is, okay. So, this is where we use 3D laser microscopy. I would say for the first time, uh, I think this was done by Professor Uday Kala and uh, we use Kurtzi Olympus who installed this equipment in our lab, because we cannot buy this type of instrument, they are very expensive. And then we use this equipment to study the depth of the cracks also. So, if you know the width, if you know the depth, it is a sort of a channel which I can find out the volume. So, ultimately the whole idea was to quantify the volume of the cracks which are getting formed in the system. Appreciate the concepts, simple concepts, simple mechanisms we have used to show how mathematical models can be developed. So, this is the crack images which we have taken, normalize them to the gray scale so that we can do mathematical modeling better in the software. And this is how the 3D image looks like. 
So, those of you who will be working in the porosity models tomorrow, hydraulic conductivity models, migration of mass flux, you will require these type of studies to be done definitely. So, courtesy modern day science and technology, we could do all this. This, this is all published. Uh, so, if you search out on the net, uh, uh, Dr. Uday Kala uh, so research papers, you will find this paper over there. This point onwards, we also learned how to reconstruct the images, which you are doing now in CT, excess CT tomography. So, reconstruction of the images. Now, reconstruction of the images is a latest fad. Uh, everybody is trying to use this, how to stitch the images as a function of depth of the crack, which fortunately nowadays softwares are doing. As I was talking about, uh, we were questioning what causes the tensile stresses in the thin films. You know, remember the analogy which I gave you potato chips and the wafers. So, this idea was there that how thick a chip or the wafer should be, so that it should not crumble by the time it is delivered to the end user. So, my student uh, Shinde, he made this setup, his master's student and uh, courtesy chemical engineering department professor Mahesh, uh, who was having this facility at that time, laser setup. What we did is, we took a laser source and we use this laser source to bombard a laser beam on the specimen of the soil, which was mounted on a silicon wafer. Silicon wafer is a surface, it is a substrate, it is a sort of a cantilever, all right. Now, this is a very thin sample of soil which has been pasted on the silicon wafer. Imagine what is going to happen when the specimen will dry up, the tensile stresses will develop and because of that tensile stress, this wafer will get deflected. Very good idea and we are thankful to Professor Mahesh for uh, giving this idea to us. You see, most of the time the ideas we get while discussing. I remember he was working on polydispersed grains for some coatings which he was doing and then we discussed about you know how are you finding out their drying characteristics. So, that drying characteristics the way they are doing we found that is quite similar to our interest. So, anyway coming back to the geometry of the problem, you have the laser beam which is falling at the substrate tip because of the drying up of this specimen, the tensile strength develops deflection deformation takes place, I can measure this angle theta, but it is very difficult. So, a better way would be to see initially where the laser beam was getting reflected by using a detector and after the drying up process is over, how much deflection has occurred in terms of linear displacement of the laser beam. So, by using a position sensitive detector, you can easily find out x value rather than measuring theta, understood. So, this was the crux of the analysis, I know L1, I know L2, I know x value, then it is a simple mathematics to obtain the tensile strength of the geomaterials. This is the equation which we used and uh, we also for, uh, determined here how much the thickness of the film would be as a function of time. So, simple logic says as time increases, the thickness of the film will decrease. This is a typical result which shows how the drying of the thin film occurs over a period of time. So, this whole thing we have obtained by measuring the soil sample on a precision balance. This is what is known as a drying curve. You have been using drying curve for obtaining shrinkage limit, correct? You are drying the sample. Here we are use, using a very thin specimen like a drop of the mineral to find out 
what is its drying pattern and then linking from this thin to thick is our mathematical projection. If you remember the previous figure, I was talking about x value, x is nothing but the linear displacement of the beam where it hits over a period of time. This type of relationship which we get from the setup at the peak of the x is the tensile strength. So, there are some relationship by which you can develop this peak value in the tensile stress as a function of time. This simple looking experiment has given us lot of insight into the mechanism of drying of minerals which are homogeneous. You must have realized this, this method is not valid for passive soils number 1, number 2 for heterogeneous material because of the limitation associated with the size of the specimen. But very encouraging trends which we are getting from here is how pure minerals will shrink and develop tensile strength because of desiccation. Just to give you an idea that how interdisciplinary and cross disciplinary research is helping us in moving ahead in this subject. We also saw the SEMs of uh, the final product and the initial product. This is how the detachment starts and this is how the detachment grows all right. You must be realizing that the magnification factor is changing. So, we are going too much into the crack which has got developed over here. We are just trying to analyze this crack at 50 x, at 250 x it looks like this. Then this is how the grains look like. We were talking about face to face, you know edge to edge, edge to face types of arrangement of the grains of uh, the clay minerals. This is another pattern which we could get to see where the detachment is taking place because of the air drying. So, our idea was to come out with a mathematical model where these type of cracking patterns can be induced by air drying and then you can use some eye vision type of a thing artificial intelligence machine learning which is now becoming very very common in every subject, but I could not do this much. So, those of you who are interested in doing AI ML type of thing in geotechnical engineering, I think this is a very hot topic on which you should be working. Because ultimately you have to train your machines to capture the cracks, when they develop, how do they develop and what type of crack geometry gets developed in a system of minerals or the soils. Through these studies, we came out with some important relationships, tensile strength as a function of saturation. This is the final saturation of the soil, more the saturation, less of the tensile strength, the more the drying and takes place, the saturation decreases, the more and more tensile strength develops, fine. We could show simple relationships. Tensile strength as a function of moisture content, L by S is nothing but liquid to solid ratio which is the moisture content. So, lesser the moisture content, higher the tensile strength, perfectly all right. So, simple relationships which are very logical, which are very sensible could be created for individual minerals. Now, when you come to the soils, soil is an agglomeration of different minerals. So, what do you have to do? You have to integrate all these results to come out with a model, which is going to be a real challenge. Just a quick brief idea to give you about what is self filling and self sealing minerals which we were discussing. On my own I have not done much research, but to me it appears that if you want to get rid of the tensile cracking of the soils, which is being a major requirement from the industries where the waste is being disposed, you know there these studies will become very, very important. See, there was a time when people were averse to the swelling and shrinking type of soils. In conventional geomechanics, the thumb rule is wherever you come across these type of soils, you excavate, remove them and fill them, fill them up with the 
good type of soil. It is not possible, good type of soil is not available. Number two, there are many industries like nuclear industry where they want active minerals. So, swelling shrinking which used to be a curse in conventional geomechanics happens to be a boon for environmental geotechnologist. This is one of the features which makes active soils much more useful in today's industrial practices. By nature, their sorption capacity is going to be very high, cation exchange capacity is going to be very high, a specific surface area is going to be very high and these properties make a very good self sealing, self healing mineral. The need of the hour is to create such type of minerals and mix them with the soil so that when the cracking initiates, these minerals will act and they will self seal these cracks. In the field of concrete technology, this is what is being tried. So, by definition, the minerals which possess built in ability to stop swelling, shrinking and cracking properties are known as self sealing, self healing minerals. These are also known as intelligent minerals and their synthesis, characterization and application in various projects related to civil, geotechnical, engineering, concrete is a real challenge. So, as I said, I have not gone beyond this, but those of you who might get an opportunity, please do something. This is going to be the most, uh, you know, top priority research area in the field of environmental geomechanics. So, with this, I will uh, stop my discussion on the cracking characteristics of soils and for that matter, even on the environmental geomechanics also. I am not using the word closing of the subject because you must have realized that the subject is still growing. It cannot be closed. There, there is nothing like you know you can say that I am just switching off the subject. What I have tried to do is I have tried to give you a lot of ideas uh, over the lectures which I have delivered, keeping in view that some of you might like to become good researchers. And with my limited understanding and knowledge of whatever experience I had in the last few years, through my students, I have tried to give you a concise picture of what has been achieved. And I have also tried to highlight what has not been achieved so far. And you must have realized that what has not been achieved is much more in volumes as compared to what has been achieved. So, whatever I have covered so far is a very modest attempt to lay the foundations of a subject known as, known as environmental geomechanics. You must have realized that most of the time I have given in creating a pretext for the course and then substantiating this pretext with several applications. And Though I am stopping at the characterization part, you must have realized that the big question is why characterization should be done and from this point onwards again you have to go back to the question that what will be the impact of human activities on the environment which can be stopped if I know the material better. So, with this note, I am stopping here. It was good to interact with you and uh, I hope that many of you will move further in the topics which I have covered and which are still unaddressed. Good luck. Thank you.